common salvation, but there was a more pressing issue that was very dangerous. Jude teaches us that ungodly men have crept into the church and they were changing God's grace into a license for sexual immorality. Wow. And that's what a lot of people are doing to this day. Jude teaches that apostates, false teachers, and mockers will arise in the last days. He also teaches how Christians can remain godly in an ungodly age. God already knew these apostates were coming. Enoch and the apostles already prophesied about them. They're not anything new. They're not, God wasn't caught off guard. God is not surprised. God wasn't surprised that all this stuff with homosexuality is happening. God already knew. Enoch already prophesied that ungodly people were coming and God was going to judge them. God always brings judgment on apostasy, deception, and unbelief. And what he did in the past, he will do in the future. And we don't ever want to test God on that. We don't want to see if God's going to do that. No, God is going to do that. The next slide. God brought judgment on Israel. He brought judgment on these angels that sinned. Sodom and Gomorrah, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. All of these are examples that we have, uh, biblical examples of how God deals with disobedient, rebellious people. Jude also gives a very elaborate, very elaborate details on uh, false teachers so that we can identify them. It's going to be almost like uh, what Peter did in 2 Peter chapter 2. He gives this big, long list of things so you can discern false uh, teachers. But he says here, don't join them or you too will be judged like them. But we instead, we're called, we're sanctified, we're kept by God. So we need to fill ourselves with God's mercy, His peace, and His love. We need to keep on praying, keep on looking, keep on building ourselves up on our most holy faith, and we need to keep ourselves in God's love. That's what we need to say, in God's love. God will keep us, but we need to keep ourselves in God's love. He has His love right there available for us. Everything is falling in Jude, but the Lord is able to keep you from falling. You don't have to fall. They may fall, but you don't have to fall because God will keep you from falling. So we don't have to fail, and we don't have to fall. So what are we to do? We're to fight for the faith. Not a faith, not a religion. We're fighting for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Us, the holy ones, not to pastors, but to the saints. And so we are to earnestly contend for faith in God because in these last days, there's going to be a lot of unbelief. All right, so let's go now. If you brought your Bibles, I want to read the first four verses from the book of Jude. And I'm going to use the uh, nomenclature where I just put the verses because there's only one, ch one chapter, so I'm not going to put chapter 1 or anything like that. I'm just going to use those verses. For Jude verses 1 through 4. Okay, so let's read it here. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified, you may have a translation that says, loved by God the Father, and preserved or kept in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. I love that. Be multiplied to you. Be yours in abundance. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, they crept in secretly, who long ago they were marked out for this condemnation or this judgment. They're ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness or sexual immorality, and they even deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. So that's 
uh, the introduction there with Jude. So tonight we're going to cover these first four verses, open us up, and then next week we're going to cover verses 5, 6, and 7, these three awesome judgments that God did. So <clears throat> let's read here from verse uh, 1. It says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified, and preserved. All right. One of the things that many commentators will note is how often Jude uses threes. He says three things about himself. He says three things about the readers. In verse 2, he says three things that you ought to be multiplied. He has three judgments in verse 5, 6, and 7. He mentions three people in verse uh, 11, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Over and over, he uses threes, 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 threes. Three things. He always It's almost like he says one, two, threes, like he preaches a sermon. One, two, three. So he uses a lot of threes. And here, as is typical of many early letters, like Jude's letter, you have the sender who was writing it. You have the next uh, line there, who he was writing to. And then he gives a greeting. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, you notice the very first word there in the book of Jude. It's the Greek word yudas, okay, yudas. And it literally means Judas, okay? So why do you think the, the word yudas in the Greek, it shows up 40 times in the New Testament, and this is the only place where it's Jude. <laughs> why do you think it says Jude? Why do you think they changed it? Even though in Greek it says Judas, why would they change it to Jude? Well, that it would be a common name that the Jews kept on carrying. Exactly. From the earliest of times, they called this the Epistle of Jude because they wanted no association with Judas. Judas gave such a bad name to Judas, the word, the name Judas, even though Judas is also the name uh, Judah like uh, Jacob's son or the tribe of Judah. It's the same word that's used. And in fact, seven times in the New Testament, it's, it's translated as Judah. But there's six different men in the New Testament that have this name, Judas. And one of them was Judas Iscariot. And so this guy's name also was Judas, but we always call him Jude. And we're going to see right now that in the Gospels, he was called Judas. Okay, so uh, he says three things about himself. Number one, he says, I'm Jude. Number two, he says, I'm a bond servant or a slave. The Greek word is doulos of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm also a brother of James. Okay, so with those three identifiers, Judas, Jude, he's a slave of Jesus, and he's a brother of James, we can already figure out who he is. We know which one of the six Judas says that he is, and one of them is, we, we'll, we'll be able to find him, is here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. It says, uh, they were saying this about Jesus, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother, his mother called Mary? And notice this, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And his sisters, are they not all with us? The same wording is found also in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. So it appears then that Jude was a half-brother, of course the same mother as G of Jesus, and he had an older brother named James. Okay, James was the same James that wrote the book of James. And uh, he was a pillar, Paul said in Galatians. He was a pillar in the church, James was. And he was an early, uh, he was one of the leaders of the early church. And if you go through the book of Acts, whenever they wanted to consult the final authority, they always went to James. James was like the oldest brother. And because he was the oldest brother, Jesus was the older brother, but then there was James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So it appeared that this Judas, this Jude, was the youngest brother that Jesus had, okay? And then the, um, 
the older brother here, Jesus, of course, being the elder brother, Mary's firstborn, and then there was James and then Judas. So we can kind of identify who he is by looking at this. But guess what? What can we know about Jude that's very interesting? And it's really an amazing story if you begin to think it through. Initially, Jude did not believe in Jesus. <laughs> think about that for a moment. It says there in John chapter 7, verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. And in Mark's gospel, chapter 3, verse 21 and 31 through 35, remember at one point they wanted to go get him because they thought he was out of his mind. Remember that? His own brothers thought he was out of his mind. He's, you're calling yourself the Messiah? But just consider the unbelief that Jude was living with because he lived in the same home with Jesus and Jesus was perfect and sinless. That, that would be a lot of pressure on you if your older brother is sinless. And he never sinned. He never sinned. That would be hard, man, because he never sinned. You're living in the same house and you still don't believe in him. So isn't it interesting that the person that we're reading from tonight we're learning from tonight was once an unbeliever. <laughs> he didn't believe in Jesus. And isn't that, wouldn't that be a good thing for us to say once again, we, are, we should never give up on anybody? Because even if a guy was living with Jesus in his own house didn't believe in him, where are the rest of us going to be, you know? I always think of John Mark, too, in, in 2 Timothy, where... At one point, John Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas and he went back to Jerusalem and he left them there on the missionary journey. And later on, Paul didn't want to do anything with John Mark. But at the end, John Mark became very useful to Paul and 2 Timothy 4.11 talks about that. So what happened? What caused a dramatic change so that Jude, Judas, this younger brother of Jesus, became now a believer? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Probably it was the resurrection that changed everything. Because right after the resurrection now, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. This is in the upper room. With the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So now, all of a sudden, we see Jude in prayer, in the upper room, and he's definitely a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> I like what um, I like what he says here in um, on the top of page ten. There, note that. Jude does not call himself an apostle, but he does call himself a slave. The Greek word is doulos. And in fact, if you go read James, who was an older brother to Jude, James also says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, if I was raised in the same home as Jesus, and we had the same mother, and he was my brother in that way, I would have said, hey, man, I really know him. You know, like I know more about him than you guys. He was raised in my house. You know? But here he doesn't say anything like that. He says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus. I'm a slave to him. He's my Lord. So suddenly he, took, he had this mentality that took him out of him being um, just a brother, a flesh brother, He's Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's not just my brother in the flesh. He's my Lord. So I'm his slave. So Schreiner says uh, this in his commentary. He said, Jude's relationship with the Lord was one of slave to master, not brother to brother. He was, it was not just his brother, man. Jesus is my master. Philip says this, what mattered now was not the natural relationship to Jesus through his mother, but the spiritual relationship with him through his father. And a doulos, whoever was a doulos 
you were just a menial slave and your daily chore was just to do whatever your master said. Whatever your master wanted you to do, that's what you did. You came early in the morning and you asked your master, what do you want me to do today? And your master gave you all these tasks and that's what you did for the day. And so J Jude and James both see themselves as doulos of Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus wants, that's what we'll do. <laughs> That was, our, that was their call. So they had no rights. The only thing they did each day was obedience to God. And so there was this shift for sure in mentality uh, that he's not just my brother, he's my Lord. <laughs> That's a big difference. So he says there, so we know who he is. Then he's the half brother of Jesus um, and he's the brother of James. So we have identified who he is. His name is Judas or Jude. And now he's writing to these people and he says three things about him. He says that they're called, they're sanctified or loved by God the Father, and they're preserved in Jesus Christ. And I want to say to you that we're going to need to know these things in this, these last days. You need to know God called you. You're sanctified by God the Father. You've been made holy and you're kept in Jesus Christ by God's power. You're going to need to know that in these last days. One commentator, an early church father, said, note that he refers to his correspondence as those who have been called because it was not they who decided to follow Jesus, but God who reached out to call them to his service. And that's true. We never call ourselves. We never say, hey, Jesus, I think I want to follow you. No, God calls us and he says, no, you're following me. You're going to follow me. And so some translations for sanctified, which means to be holy, like the NIV, they use the word loved. But whether we're loved by the Father or sanctified the Father by the Father, both of them are true statements. And so if, it has, if it's true that the original Greek says loved by God the Father, then we're going to see the word loved. Loved by God, verse 1. Love in verse 2. And beloved in verse 3. So he's going to talk a lot about love, which is going to be a very important thing. But what I want to get to is this statement here, preserved or kept or protected, because that's going to become a key word in the book of Jude. The Greek word is toreo, and it means to watch, guard, to take care of, to attend to carefully from the word teros, which means a watch. Now, I don't know, brothers, but I think that is powerful, that God is carefully watching over your life. He's carefully monitoring how you're doing. He is guarding you and keeping you and strengthening you. And, and if it wasn't for Jesus, we would fall apart. We, we would have so many temptations, none of us could survive. But we are being kept in and by Jesus Christ. And that's why we can say at the end, now unto him who is able to keep me from falling. The reason you and I can um, withstand and persevere and, and keep going without failing and falling and completely falling apart is because Jesus is keeping us together. He's keeping us. That's awesome. So, so can, you see what J can you see what Jude is doing? Right at the very beginning, he's telling you, you're kept by Jesus Christ. You're kept in Jesus Christ. This is not about you just trying harder and you're going to pray more. No, God is watching over you. Jesus is watching over you. And he's very carefully looking over your life and strengthening you so that you can be strong. And Green says here, it's interesting to compare this emphasis on Christ's keeping power with its correlative in verse 21, keep yourselves in God's love. It's God's part to keep man but it's man's part to keep himself in the love of God. These are the two sides to Christian perseverance. So God is going to do his part, which is the hard part. He's going to keep you. But you need to keep yourself in God's love. You need to continue on in God's love. 
and stay strong in God's love. So this is a powerful truth in these last days of apostasy, rebellion, falling away, and abandonment. It's a powerful truth that you and I need to grab a hold of today. You are kept by and in Jesus Christ. That's strong. I love that. I am kept by the Lord. I'm not just relying on my own strength. I'm relying on the Lord to keep me. That is a good truth that we need. What did Peter say in 1 Peter 1.5? That we are those who are kept by the power of God. How? Through faith for salvation. His part is he keeps us by his power. Our part is to believe that he's doing that. So there's a part we play. The NIV says, who through faith we're shielded by God's power. So toreo, that Greek word to be kept, is a critical word in the book of Jude. It's going to show up. And it's going to show up in verse 6 twice with the angels where it says they did not keep their domain or their place of authority, but now they're kept or reserved in everlasting chains. It's going to show up in verse 13. The apostates now are reserved for blackness of darkness forever. And in verse 21, Toreo shows up again. You're kept. You need to keep yourself in the love of God. So what is, what it, what is this use of the word Toreo here in the book of Jude? In other words, you need to keep yourselves in the things of God. Don't get out of control or out of line because if not, God's going to put you in your place. <laughs> and see, take those angels, for example. What did they do? They were in heaven in the very presence of God and they didn't stay in their position of authority. So they came down here and caused a lot of trouble. And because they did that, God put them into everlasting chains. So they didn't keep their position, so God put them where he wanted them to be. And that's what we need to do. We need to stay where God keeps us. Don't go out of bounds. Don't get out of control. Don't go down to the local bar and have a drink <laughs> because you're going to get out of line, and God's going to put you into line if you don't do that. So we need to keep ourselves in the things of God, and if you don't keep yourself in the things of God, God's going to deal with you. <laughs> Whenever these people got out of line, God put them in a place of judgment, unfortunately. But we don't want that. We want to stay right where God has us. <laughs> don't get ahead of God. Stay with the Lord. He'll keep you in the things of God. And I want to read kind of the last uh, verses here of, of different translations, that part about being kept. The NLT says that God keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. Ah, I love that. That is such a simple but powerful statement. God keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. You know, when... You have an elderly family member and you have to put them in a nursing home or, or like Ramona, she was taking care of her mother. When you're in somebody's care, if they're reliable and they do a good job, that's awesome. They'll take care of those people. They'll make sure they're changed, they're fed, they're taken care of, they're showered, whatever they have to be done. You know they're in good care. Isn't it awesome to be in the care of Jesus Christ? That's the best care right there. He's going to take care of you. Another translation says, we are those who live in the protection of Jesus Christ. And you guys know this, Jesus protects us. He really does. He protects us from a lot of temptations. He protects us from a lot of evil things. There's a lot of stuff I'm convinced that doesn't come against the Christians because Jesus is protecting us. If, if we're not in Jesus, we're wide open for the devil. But because we're in Father's house, we're sons and daughters of God, we're in the care of Jesus Christ. And we must put our confidence and our trust in that, that that is really the case. The NCVC, God, the NCV says, God the Father loves you, and you have been kept safe in Jesus Christ. We talk a lot about apostasy. 
We talk a lot about people falling away. I think we also need to talk about God keeping us. <laughs> we need to talk about we can stand. We are protected. We are kept by Jesus Christ. That is important. Now this next verse, I love this verse. I love this verse. To me, it's like throwing a dive in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> it's like, yes, this is what I need. This is what every Christian needs. NIV says, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. The NLT say, may God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Another translation says, may mercy, peace, and love be yours in full measure. And finally, it says, I pray that God will greatly bless you with kindness, peace, and love. Now, let me ask you, what more do you need than these three things? <laughs> an abundance of mercy, an abundance of peace, and an abundance of love from God. That's all we need. Linsky says this, multiplied to you implies that they already have these three, but that now in the trying situation that has developed, they more than ever need these three gifts from God. Would you guys agree with me that in these last days, when people are pulling away from God, when you see all this ungodliness and immorality, it brings, it unsettles you. There's no peace. Uh, when you see all the judgments, you need mercy. When you see all the wickedness abounding, you need love. All of these things we're going to need for what he's getting ready to tell us. Let's go to the top of page 12. Levy says this, people who have made peace with God receive peace from God, which produces the peace of God in their lives. We have peace with God. Second Peter, I love it, first chapter one, verse two, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. The more you get to know Jesus, the more peace you will have in your life. First Peter 1, 2 says, may God give you more and more grace and peace. Another says, I pray that you will enjoy more and more of God's grace and peace. Hilliard, the commentator, says, Jude prays that his readers may receive them in abundance. That Greek word, play through nethe, means to be filled to capacity. I don't know about you, but I would love to be filled to capacity with God's mercy, peace, and love. Especially right now in these dark hour, this late hour, where all this wickedness and evil, I want to be filled with God's mercy, with God's peace, and with God's love. With all the apostasy, unfaithfulness, desertion, rebellion of the last days, it's imperative that you and I keep ourselves in the love of God. We must. It's, it's urgent that we um, do that. And um, I, I just want to mention that I went to... Uh, I see, a, I see a therapist, a counselor, doctor, uh, a guy over at the Link Care Counseling Center. I meet with him once a month. And when I first went to him about a year and a half ago, um, my first session with him, I told him that I have a lot of anxiety. I have a lot of worry. That I feel restless in my spirit. And I need to, something's, not con I'm not connecting right with the Lord. Something is restless about me and anxious and nervous and worried. I worry too much. And so 
this counselor, this psychologist, he sat there and he listened to me for like an hour. And I just told him all the worries and all my anxiety that was on my heart at that time. And when, he, when I finished talking, he just looked at me and he says, what you need is to experience the love of God. <laughs> he goes, you don't have to do anything for it. You just need to receive God's love for your life. And when he said that to me, I felt like I had hope. I left that office refreshed. And that's been my focus now, is for me to stay focused on the love of God. That love that God has for me. And a lot of times we forget that, that as basic as that is, but that is the most powerful thing on planet Earth, is God's love that he has. I heard Billy Graham say this one time. He says, the most important message one human being can tell another human being is about the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the most important thing we can communicate to another person is God's love for them. Well, you guys know what's going to happen here. Matthew 24, verse 12. Because of the increase, abounding of wickedness, what's going to happen? The love of most will grow cold. What's that's going to happen in these last days as you see these riots and racism and terrorism and shootings and school shootings and violence and drugs and, 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 and all kinds of terrible things that we see in the world. People are going to turn into themselves. People are going to not, their love is going to be cold. They're not going to want to love anymore because they're going to, they've been hurt too much or they've been abused too much or whatever. People's love is going to turn cold. When I first taught this class in Jude uh, many years ago, I got an email from a Christian who said, I am quitting the church. Not our church, but it was another church. He says, I'm quitting going to church and being part of any church. He goes, because there's too many problems. Pastors cause too many problems. There's too many problems among people. There's all these troubles. And so he's quit. He says, I'm just going to stay home. <laughs> Because he doesn't want to get hurt anymore. He doesn't want to feel hurt anymore. There it is again, a love that's going cold. We're going to, like you said, we're going to need one another in these last days. Carter says this, considering what we're talking about here and what Jesus said here in Matthew 24, Carter says this, it may suggest that one of the outstanding reasons for apostasy is a lack of love among brothers. Could it be that one of the main reasons people are turning away from the Lord is because of a, they're seeing a lack of love among us as Christians. That's a deep thought. That maybe some people that are coming to our church Sunday by Sunday, they're not being reached, we're not reaching out to them in love. And maybe that lack of love is calling, causing them to pull away from the things of God. And maybe we need to reach out more in love to people. Because some people don't like themselves. They, they see themselves as unlovely. And maybe they need the love from us. I love what Phillips said in his commentary. He said, Jude has some very harsh things to say. But he invokes a multiplication of mercy, peace, and love upon the embattled church. We can never have too much mercy, too much peace, or too much love. We're going to need those things for what he's getting ready to teach us and talk to us about. Verse 3. This, as Connor says, is the key verse. And it's the whole purpose in Jude writing this epistle. And I want to not miss this word. The very first word, you may have a translation that says, dear friends, but this very first word is beloved. And you're going to see that word again in verse 17, but you beloved. And you're going to see it again in verse 20, but you beloved. That word beloved, agapetoi, is mentioned in Jude there, verse 3, verse 17, verse 20. And it's the people who are loved by God. Once again, a focus on God's love. 
These are people who are loved by God that Jude is writing to. The NCV says this, and I think this brings out a key thing. Dear friends, I wanted very much to write about the salvation we all share, but I felt the need to write you about something else. I want to encourage you to fight hard for the faith that was given the holy people of God once and for all time. So there it is. I wanted to write to you about something, about salvation that we share, but no, there's something a little more urgent that I need to write to you about, and it has to do with you fighting the good fight of faith. So what was more urgent than a positive message about their salvation was the danger of ungodly and deceptive men. So that caused Jude to write this whole letter to begin with. Top of page 13. The phrase to contend earnestly is one Greek word, ep agonizomai, to agonize upon. You can see the word agonize in ep agonizomai. The verb form to contend also, Bloom says, is a present infinitive, showing that the Christian struggle is to be continuous. How many of you found that out? Monday, you got to fight in the faith. Tuesday, you got to fight in the faith. Wednesday, you got to fight in the faith. Saturday, you got to fight in the faith. Sunday, you got to fight in the faith. It's going to be a continuous struggle and an agonizing, and, and we talked about that a few Sundays ago. The agon was the arena where people fought and wrestled uh, in the agon, and they were in agony, fighting one another, the agonia, and he, that's what he says here. I want you to get in there and fight. This is going to be a fight because these people are ungodly, and they're deceptive, and they're apostates, and they're going to deny the Lord, and they're going to try to trick people and deceive people, so you're going to have to get in there and fight for faith because there's going to be so much unbelief that you're going to have to deal with. And we see a lot of unbelief. I love, again, what Philip says here. The expression earnestly contend occurs only here in the scriptures, and that's true. Epagonizomai only shows up here. It means to contend about an issue as a combatant. In other words, you've got to be a soldier. You've got to get your gun out. You're going to have to get into the fight. The adverb earnestly is added to convey the intensity of the verb. When the great truths of Christianity are attacked, it is criminal to sit on the sidelines. Therefore, Jude sounds the call to battle. We can't just sit back and say, oh, you know what, that's what he believes and we believe something. No, we got to fight the good fight of faith. That's why we're putting all these teachings out on homosexuality and hell and anger and all these different things and i'm putting one out on jude because we got to fight for the faith we got to contend because there's a lot of people that are saying everybody's going to heaven nobody goes to hell anymore <laughs> you can't read that in jude jude's telling you hey there's people going to hell we're going to talk next week about the eternal fire and these angels that got thrown into hell hey people go to hell there's people preaching today nobody goes to hell that's false well in a few verses, we're going to see Michael, the archangel, is contending with the devil. And we're going to have to be contending, too, with the enemy of our souls. The believers are to contend for the faith. I mean, the faith, not just for faith. This is the faith. This is a faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. we got to contend for that. Christians will need to contend for and keep the faith because many will fall away from the faith. And I want to s stop here for just a moment and talk about a previous student. When I first taught this class years ago, um, over the last week or two, I put on my headphones and I was listening to my messages that I preached back then. Uh, on these very verses, I was trying to remind myself all that I said back then. And lo and behold... In that class, I heard the voice of somebody in this class on Jude. And every time I was saying something, he would go, Amen, brother. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. And I remember that brother. And I remember when he gave the student presentation, 
man, he was on fire. And I can still remember what he said. He goes, we need to put on the full armor of God. And he was standing right here telling us about putting on the full armor of God. And we need to be strong in these last days. And, and so he was preaching, man, this guy was preaching. He, he did the homework. I mean, he wrote out long answers. And when we were doing the class, he was raising his hands like he had stuff that he wanted to contribute to the class. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we did that class. Can I tell you right now, he's not serving the Lord anymore. He backslid. He abandoned his wife and his kids. He's living with another woman, unmarried right now. What happened? What happened? That wasn't that long ago. He was standing right here. It was not somewhere over there on the other side or some other country. It happened right here at Clovis Christian Center at our church. Somebody was here listening to the book of Jude. We taught him about being strong in the faith and contending for the faith and don't follow these apostates. And look where he's at right now. He's living with another. He's abandoned his kids and his wife, and he's living for the devil. I don't know about you, but that grieves my spirit that he could be right here in our church, hear this message, and now he's very well in the very clutches of the enemy doing his will. But think about it now. Just think about that. You guys all kind of like, it hurt, right? It kind of hurts to hear that. It hurt me as the pastor to hear that. But guess what? That's happening all over the place. And you can say, what's the use? What's the use, David? Why, why do I keep fighting as a pastor? People are standing right here, and I'm telling them about Jude, and I'm telling them about standing strong, and they just turn right around and go do all of that. What's the use? And my heart can get hard. My heart can get cold towards this brother. And right now I can just think, that no good, dirty dog. You know what? I need to pray for him. If I really care and I really love this guy, in fact, I'm trying to get a hold of him right now so I can go. I want to talk to him in person. What are you doing? <laughs> get back in the things of God. That's the right approach, not, oh, I just throw in, I, I quit. I'm done. <laughs> I'm not going to do this anymore. Nobody cares. See, you can right away cop an attitude, right? And it's going to be an attitude of coldness towards other people. Why? Because you're seeing the wrong things they're doing. And that's exactly what he says. Don't do that. Stay in the love of God. Stay in the mercy of God. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Keep in the mercy of the Lord. Keep the peace of God. Because all these people are going to do these things that doesn't mean you have to do them. That doesn't mean you have to now give up. No, get back into the fight. Get back into the arena. You may be tired, but get back into the arena. God's going to strengthen you. God's going to fill you. God's going to equip you so you can get back into the fight. But this really did happen. And I was listening. I hadn't even thought about it. I mean, it's been years ago since we did the Jude class. But I put on my headphones and I was listening and I heard his voice. And I knew who he was. And he's no longer here. And he's no longer following the Lord. We got to keep on fighting. Levy says this, if believers do not know doctrine, how can they stand for the faith? If they cannot stand for their faith, their personal faith will be overthrown. You know what? If we don't know the truth, and we're not living the truth, and we're not in the truth, how are we going to stand for the truth? I, you know, honestly, I wish this class, and I know many people were out today for different reasons, but I wish this place was full so that we can together study the Word of God. And you guys are going to, we're going to have student presenters starting next week. We can study and learn from each other and build each other up in our most holy faith because we got to know what Jude is saying here. This really is happening right now, and we need to embrace the truth that he's telling us here. Moose says this, There is a set of beliefs based in the teaching and the work of Christ 
developed and passed on by the apostles that is non-negotiable. To be a Christian is to agree with these beliefs and to reject them is to cease to be a Christian. So we need to know the truth that sets us free. We need to be in the truth of God because in these last days, our faith is going to be tested. That's for sure. And notice that this faith was not delivered to apostles or prophets or pastors, but to the saints. And it's the saints who have to contend and fight for the faith of God in our midst. And I like the word saints there, by the way. The Greek word is holy ones. It's the same word as Holy Spirit, or when those living creatures said holy, 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 it's the same word, saints is the holy ones. That's who we are. We're the holy ones. That's why we should be about holiness. Anyway, here in Luke 18, 8, do you remember Jesus said when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus said that. When he comes, is he going to find faith on the earth? Why would Jesus ask that? I got a feeling there's not going to be a lot of faith. I think there's going to be a great harvest. I think a lot of people are going to get saved in the last days. But I think when he comes, one of the, th one of the things he's going to look for is faith. And he asks this question, when I come, am I going to find faith on the earth? Hmm. And, and remember when he said this in Luke 18, it was talking about the, wimp, the, the widow woman before the unjust judge. And he gave us that parable to teach us that we ought always to pray and never give up. That's where our faith is being tested is in prayer. I'm telling you, the biggest area to check to see where your faith is is in your prayer life because people who are constantly praying are the people who are really depending on the Lord and trusting Him. They must contend for the faith because God destroyed those who did not have faith or believe. We're going to look at that verse next week, chapter, uh, verse 1-5 there. The way Christians contend for the faith is by building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Your faith is holy, and we must contend for it. Okay, now as we go to verse 4, I want to read this important quote from Steve Gallagher. Man, this is a verse... This is a quote that really makes a strong statement about something. Top of page 14. Unfortunately, when most Christians think of false teachers, they are missing one of the key elements in the descriptions that Jesus and Paul gave. They have overlooked the fact that the deceivers of the last days will be within the church. Instead of looking for sheep, most are looking for wolves. Instead of looking for angels of light, they are looking for cult leaders and other obvious servants of Satan. What many fail to realize is that the false teachers appear as sheep and as angels. Wow. You know why? That's why here in verse 4, why is it that people could creep in unnoticed? Why is it that they could slip in secretly? Why did that happen? You know why? Because they look just like us. They look like sheep, but they have sheep's clothing on. <laughs> Underneath, they're wolves. That's why they slip right on in. They look like us. They talk like us. They look just like us. We don't really notice them. Well, the NLT says... I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into the, your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. Isn't that something? We can have God's grace and just live an ungodly life. It's okay. NIV says they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. They got their license, and now they're going to get on that bandwagon of immorality. The CEV says some godless people have, sn have sneaked in. That verb, 
crept in unnoticed is the first Greek word. And its position shows its importance. So like in our English translation there, it says crept in unnoticed. That's kind of like not at the beginning, but in Greek, it puts it way at the very beginning. And the Greek text sometimes does that to show this is very important. They're creeping in unnoticed. D.R. McConnell in a book called A Different Gospel, he says the tremendous appeal of heresy is that it looks and sounds like the real thing. Not only do different gospels look like the real thing, they also sound like it as well. That's why it's so hard to detect. That's why you have to be discerning. That's why you have to be in the Word and know the truth. The next slide. Our text describes these certain men as having crept in privily. That's the King James. Literally, the expression may be rendered, have settled down alongside. They sit with us in our churches, and they are alongside of us in our Sunday schools, Cotter says. Wow. They're right there. They're right next to us. And later on in verse 12, when we get to there, he says that they have joined our love feast. They show up to our fellowships. They're eating with you at your fellowship meals. They'll show up. They'll be right there. You won't be able to really spot them. They'll be just right there with you, feasting with you. But there's one person they won't fool is God. He already saw them coming long ago. God already knew they were going to come, these apostates. Schreiner says the judgment that these intruders were face was prescripted long ago. Jude reminds his readers at the outset that the, these adversaries had not taken God by surprise. That's true. God already knew they were coming. God already told Enoch to prophesy about it, and he told the apostles that mockers were going to come in the last days. At the top of page 15, we're going to move here to a close. The condemnation of such people was recorded or written about long ago. God is not surprised by this. God already knew they were coming. God not only knows what apostates and false teachers are doing, he has already pronounced judgment on them. God is way ahead of them. <laughs> Enoch, all the way back in Genesis 5, already prophesied what God is going to do to them in judgment. The apostles of Jesus already predicted that they were coming in verses 17 and 18. The apostates have been marked out for judgment so don't join them or you too will be judged. That's what Jude is trying to tell us. Don't join in with these people. Don't backslide away from the Lord. Don't end up denying the Lord and moving away from the faith. No, stay in the faith. So that is why we must earnestly contend for the faith. Because if we don't, many will end up denying Jesus. Now, that's serious, right? He says it's going to be denying our only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where this ends up, is people end up in unbelief and in darkness, and they end up moving away from the things of God, and they end up denying the Lord. Philip says the apostate is not only ungodly and unholy, but he's also unruly because he denies the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter warned us also, but there will be false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying, there it is again, the Lord who bought them. And they bring on themselves swift destruction. And notice this, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. blasphemed. People follow that way, it's going to bring the way of truth into, into disrepute. Notice the word destruction there. Destructive heresies, swift destruction, destructive ways 
when the enemy, the apostates and false teachers come in, they bring destruction. And remember what Paul told uh, Titus? He goes in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. And this way, a lot of people are today. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they are denying him. I want to close with one of the apostates who is among us. His name is Jim Swilly. Jim Swilly was a charismatic pastor. He was the pastor of a mega church in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area. He was on national TV. He was known internationally. He was known nationally. His church was so large that the facilities were on 43 acres of land. They had so many properties on that piece of land that when they put that property for sale, and I'm going to tell you why they put it up for sale, it was selling for $18.8 million. That's how, much, that's how big his church was. Not only that, he was a pastor. He, not only was he a pastor, but he was also a bishop, an overseer of 190 churches. We're talking... Church, like our church, in terms of believing in the gifts of the Spirit and, 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 and healing and preaching the gospel, Jim Swilly was it, man. He was on TV. He was, he was well-known, very popular, very well-liked. Well, he began to have these feelings of homosexuality. And he went and told his wife. He goes, I can't take it anymore. He goes, I just don't feel like I love you, and uh, I need to just be real. I need to be who I am. And it was Jim Swilly that said, there's two things that I have from God that I cannot change. He goes, one was the call into the ministry, and the other was my sexual orientation. That was the deception. He says, I am a homosexual. That's who I am. And so his wife told him, go ahead. You better announce it to the church. So he stood up one Sunday morning in 2010 to this national TV audience, to his whole church of thousands of people, and he said, I am a homosexual. Shortly after that, he divorced his wife. And in 2015, New Year's Eve, the next day was 2000, January 1st, 2015, he went to New York and he married his homosexual partner, Ken Marshall, in New York. That was even before the Supreme Court made the decision in 2016 to um, legalize it because New York had already allowed them to have homosexual marriages. So what did he do? Well, when he made that announcement, it crashed the church. It crashed the ministry. That whole 43-acre property and everything went into foreclosure. The bank that had it was a Christian bank. It was a Christian-owned bank, a credit union, and nobody wanted to pay. Nobody could, no church could pay $20 million for facilities unless you're a, a big church. So he crashed that whole church all for, to embrace homosexuality. What does he do? Rather than get out of the ministry. He went and started another church. <laughs> he left all that in foreclosure. He walked away from it all, ran off, married this, his partner, started a new church called Metron Community. And now he's still on Facebook. He's still preaching. There's about 300 people that came over from that church, followed him, and he's preaching with his gay partner there with him on stage. Here was a man that was very successful doing all these things, overseeing almost 200 churches. And now, this is where he is. Now, he's living in marriage with another man. How did this happen? Why did this happen? 
You know, the more I think about it, the other day I was getting mad. That's what I do. I was getting mad. You know what? Here I go again. I'm checking my attitude. What is going to be my attitude towards this man? And so I found myself, and it, it really energized me. I found myself praying for him and that other guy. And when I started praying for them, rather than having this defeatist, angry, upset attitude, I felt energized in my faith. Whether he ever turns or not, I don't know. I sometimes doubt that he will ever change. But here is a man, and he, he's doing exactly what it has here. He's turning the grace of God into a license for sexual immorality. I can do whatever I want now. I'm under the grace of God. This is who I am. This is who God made me to be. And he's denying now the very Lord who saved him. But these are the people that are among us right now. This guy has influenced perhaps millions of people he's influencing. And you go look at all of the posts on his Facebook page. You go look at the, his website of his church. And all these people are telling him what a great thing he's doing living with this man. Christians quoting scripture on Facebook. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? But we cannot allow that to affect how we're going to live for God. We must continue to live despite the people who are coming to turn the grace of God into lewdness. And now by their actions, they're denying the very Lord that bought them. This is real. This is happening. This affected many multitudes of people in the Atlanta area by what Jim Swilly did. And in fact, it was such, if you can look at the little thing there, it was on CNN. I mean, that's how big he was. It was on CNN when he made this announcement that I am gay, comes out to his congregation and it crashed the whole ministry that he had and left his wife and his kids, four kids, and ran off. 